Yep, have a seat. <laughs> okay, um, so today we are finishing. Okay, I know we've been going over the uh, the feast of uh, of the Lord, God's holy days. We've been going over this for the the last couple of months. We've even had some celebrations here at the church. We had. Uh, Passover celebration that was that was pretty neat and then what uh, what was the recent one we just had not too long ago that we had outside you know with the feast of Shavuot right the feast of Pentecost right and uh, uh, that was uh, I think we had a pretty good success on that so remember we have seven of them we've been going over seven different feasts we are actually at the last one. This is number seven, okay? And today we're going to be going over the Feast of Tabernacles, which is the Feast of Sukkot, right? So everyone say with me, Feast of Sukkot. Or just say Sukkot. Okay, Sukkot, okay? Or Tabernacles, uh, maybe everyone's heard. Um, we'll be covering the basics regarding uh, Sukkot, or Feast of Tabernacles, and it's the last of uh, our Father's holy days, right? We're going to go over... You know, basically the how, the when, and uh, basically what uh, the prophetic of this uh, this feast, which this one, believe it or not, like the first uh, spring feast, which is the four. Does everyone remember the f first four feasts? And maybe we can review it a little bit. Obviously, we are not going to even get close to finishing the lesson today. It might be a two or even three part, but this is going to be the last one uh, of the seven feasts. We'll go over the, the, the review right now, and then we'll name them in order, okay? All right, so first of all, let's uh, go over what is the Feast of Sukkot and Tabernacles. What does this mean, and how is it relevant to believers today? Uh, well, obviously, we know that Sukkot, Tabernacle, is one of God's holy days, his Moedim, right? His appointed times. We've gone over this before. Um, we know that these days... now. A lot of times, and I know I've said this many times before, but I still occasionally hear things uh, and uh, I've even been questioned by it. Like, well, isn't this, why are we even learning about this? Or why do we even have to practice things or celebrate these things, you know, celebrate these holidays or holy days? And the first question I always get is, isn't this for the Jews, right? Isn't these things for the Jews, right? I mean, we're Christian, right? And I want to let you know that, no, no, this is not just for the Jews, right? Uh, this is for all people. Um, if you look in Leviticus 19.34, it says, But the stranger that dwells with you shall be unto you as if one born among you, and you shall love him as yourself. For ye were a stranger in the land of Egypt. I am, our, I am God, Yahuwah. So Paul teaches that we are no longer Gentiles when we become believers in Messiah, okay? Let's go to Ephesians 2.11. Do you want to go to Ephesians 2.11? or do you, It's really short. I'll just read it for you. But Paul uh, says in Ephesians 2.11 through 13, it then says, We do not want to be Gentiles. Now, remember, he's talking to the Gentiles, right? He's talking to the Gentiles, and he's saying, We don't want to be Gentiles. Yahuwah, God, made a covenant with Israel. So basically, it's almost like like someone going and just like a bunch of like Hispanics or Mexicans like, hey, we don't want to be Mexican. You know, and you're like, what? You know, but the reason why Paul is teaching them this is that God, our father, made a covenant with who? He made a covenant with Israel, right? He made a see. On, uh, we remember that on on Mount Sinai, when when the people came out of Egypt and they went, and then that's what Shavuot was about, about right? The wedding uh, anniversary, the wedding day. You know, we were getting married with the Lord. He made a covenant that day with Israel. He separated us from the rest of the world, and he says, uh, "You are now the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob." Who does Jacob become? becomes Israel, right? We want to be the seed of Abraham. And we, and Paul is telling us, look, when you come into Messiah, when you come into Christ, you are no longer Gentile. You become part of Israel, right? Amen. Hallelujah. So we need to understand that, no, this is not just from the Jews. And, you know, just a side note, like when you really look at it, uh, 
And, you know, I was kind of studying and, you know, you kind of study history and stuff like that. Now, the Jews are just one tribe of Israel, right? They're the tribe of Judah, right? And there's 11 other tribes, you know? Uh, so when, you know, the whole history of Israel, when it divided into the, the northern kingdom, right? The northern kingdom and then the, the, the other king, the Jerusalem was the other kingdom, right? And then the northern kingdom got defeated and conquered by the, like they were the Assyrians, right? The Assyrians came and destroyed them. And all those tribes, basically 10 tribes, were dispersed, right? And then the other two tribes, which was pretty much Judah and Benjamin, uh, then later they got all, they were all messed up. And by the way, the northern kingdom was already all pagan. They were doing all sorts of things. That's why God allowed them to be defeated by the Assyrians. And Jerusalem was no different, right? I mean, they were strong for a while. They, you know, they had King David and then Solomon. And then after that, things just fell apart. And then what happened? God allowed Babylon to come in. And they were also dispersed. They were taken into uh, ca captivity for 70 years. So what, what I'm trying to say is that when they were back, when they came back, when they were released, these tribes went from to the north, to the south, east, went all over. And we're talking about thousands of years ago, okay? So when you really study the chances of us here, everybody having some kind of bloodline to one of these tribes, it's very, very likely. So a lot of times we're like, oh, well, I'm like, I'm like a Jew. You know, I was born in Jerusalem and, you know, this and that. Uh, but the truth is, we don't really, really know. There, the chances are we all have some bloodline. And if you don't, it's okay. Because when you come into Christ, you come into Messiah, we come, become grafted in and we become part of God's people, his separated people, his covenant people. We become part of Israel. Hallelujah. Amen. Why don't we give a big hand clap for that? I mean, we're, we're God's chosen people. Amen. Okay. So we don't want to be Gentiles. So don't be going around boasting, hey, I'm a Gentile. Paul says, no, we're not Gentiles. Okay. All right. So, um, and, and a lot of times too, don't be deceived about like Israel over there uh, uh, being like the main focus of everything. Because like I said, things have changed. A lot of things have been changed. Uh, in Isaiah 41.8, uh, it says, But thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, who I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. And then Galatians says, 2.29, And if ye be in Christ, this is a, uh, a, a, a proving of what I'm saying, if ye be in Christ, then ye are Abraham's seed, and heirs according to his promise. So, when he says, if you're Abraham's seed, seed means his son, right? Uh, and remember, we said Abraham, then Isaac, and then Jacob. Jacob becomes Israel. So if we are to be Abraham's seed, we are to become uh, part of Israel. And if you're Abraham's seed, we are heirs according to the promise. We are uh, uh, separated to, be, uh, to have that promise to be part of his people. Amen. Okay. So... Before we go on, remember, we're still going with Sukkot, so we're like, wait, what is he talking about, okay? I'm not promoting, um, a lot of times we're like, like, what is he promoting? I'm not promoting Judaism, you know? A lot of times people are like, um, you know, should, I guess a quick story. When I was younger, um, I remember growing up, and there was a lot, I guess the, the Judaism thing was really, really popular, and I remember anything that had to do with like Israel or like, um, you know, like wearing a tali or, or um, um, I, no, that's a kippah and then the tali and then the seat seats. And and a lot of the, some of those things are, are, are good. And I'm not, and I have, actually everything's good. What I'm trying to say is that when I was growing up, I remember that I grew up thinking that, man, if you were part of Israel, the star of David and all these things, man, you could do no wrong, right? Like you had them on a higher level, you know? And I always thought like, man, you know, pr you know pray for the peace of Israel and all this. But then I started learning not too long ago that Judaism is really, really far gone when you really look at a lot of the things they do. Now, some of the things they do are good. Just kind of how you look at Christianity, right? If you look at Christianity, Think of a Judaism as this on this far right, 
And Christianity is a lot, the modern Christian church is on the far left. I mean, the Christian t- church today is almost in, basically an apostasy. I mean, I've seen some crazy things. I'm sure you all have too. You go on YouTube and you look at different churches, modern churches today and what they're doing. And I mean, it's it's crazy, right? You you're, you would it's like, am I in a church or I'm at a concert or am I at a truck rally? I, I don't know, you know. So obviously, we know that in the last days there was going to be a falling away from the Christian church. So just like Christianity today has been so corrupted, so has Judaism. In fact, during Jesus' time, our Messiah, uh, he was very against Judaism in some ways. He, he was against the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and stuff. And, and they were the ones that actually killed him, right? Why? Because, and the key, because of their traditions, because of their man-made rules, laws, traditions, they started taking what was in Scripture and started interpreting it and making it into their own, which is Judaism or the Talmud or what they call it today. Just like today in Christianity, we take a lot of scripture and we interpret it, and then we uh, give that interpretation to our kids and then their kids, and then all of a sudden there's this new doctrine. You don't believe me? How many denominations do we have? There's Christianity has a bunch of dumb denominations. I was going to say denominate. Denominations. Maybe they should be called that. I don't believe in having all these denominations. I believe that we are set apart for Christ. We should go by his scripture. And if anytime anyone asks me, like, what denomination you are? Uh, I don't know. What were the disciples? Uh, followers of Jesus Christian? Yeah, that's what I am. You know, I'm a Christian. But yeah, well, you're not Baptist or whatever. No, no, I'm, I'm just Christian, you know. And I think that's, that's where we go because just like Judaism and their man-made traditions and laws and traditions, Christianity has done the same thing. When you look at Catholics and you look at Baptists and Presbyterians and the Charismatic Church and all this stuff. Uh, oh, wow. At first I thought that was feedback or something. I was like, uh, so just like, just like the Christian church, it has been uh, in, infected with all these different man-made traditions. Okay, so let us go on. Let us review how we got to the Feast of Sukkot, the seventh feast. Does everyone know what the first feast is? Now, the first one starts uh, uh, in the spring. Yeah, in the spring. So we start with, it starts with a P and ends with over. Oh, Passover. I should have said P and Passover. No, I don't want to say that. (laughs) Passover, yeah. Okay, so we got Passover, all right? And then after that, we got, right after that, we got unleavened bread. And then first fruits, and then the one that we just uh, celebrated recently, the feast of Shavuot, yeah, or Pentecost. You know, we got either way. And then, uh, then we go into the fall feast, and the first one is the feast of. Should I play it? Feast of trumpets? No, nah, I'm not gonna play it today. Eric's a trumpet player, so he'll 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 crit- critique me. Uh, Okay, and then the one that we were just going over recently was the Feast of Atonement, right? <clears throat> God's the holiest day of the year. And then that leads us back to the Feast of Sukkot. So Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, Shavuot, Yom Teruah, which is the Feast of Trumpets, Yom, uh, Yom Kippur, which is Atonement, and Sukkot, which is Tabernacles. Now, all of these uh, are called feast days. Not necessarily they're all feast days, like we learned uh, the, the Feast of uh, uh, Atonement. If anything, it was quite the opposite. Remember, uh, do, do you all kind of remember of what, what was uh, the Feast of Atonement all about? Remember, this was the feast where uh, it was considered the holiest day of the year when the high priest would go in to the temple, into the tabernacle, and make a sacrifice for the sins of Israel, right? And um, this was the Feast of Atonement. This was considered uh, a kind of more of a somber kind of a holiday. Uh, it was uh, fasting. Actually, fasting is very much promoted. You would basically be denying the flesh, right, for, the, for, this, uh, for this day. And then five days later, then we get into Sukkot, which is going to be the quite opposite. Actually, the Feast of Sukkot and Tabernacles is going to be one of the joyous uh, festivals. Um, 
And believe it or not, um, it's actually commanded that we uh, celebrate this feast for like seven days. So it's actually a party for seven days. Uh, so, I mean, God, when God was like designing his holiday, he was like, you know what? I, want, I, don't want, I don't want them just to party for one day. I want them to party for seven days. And actually, this one has even one extra day. Eight days. Just go, you know, have a good time. Uh, uh, sing and dance and worship and, and eat. Eat good. So no diets during this uh, feast. So obviously a very, very fun time. So let us get into scripture and, and let's go into the command of the Feast of Sukkot. Let us go to Leviticus 23. And we can all turn to Leviticus 23. And uh, it's going to be verses 34 through 36. And I did forget to put the timer, so some of y'all might have to keep me on time today, if possible. Okay, um, Leviticus 23, verses 34 through 36. Amen? Okay. And here is basically the commandment. So you don't think that I'm just like making this up. This is a commandment given to Moses uh, for the people of Israel. And he's telling them, I want you to celebrate these things. I want you to acknowledge these things. Kind of like the Ten Commandments, right? He's telling you to do these things. It says, speak unto the children of Israel, saying, the 15th day of the seventh month shall be a feast of tabernacles or Sukkot. For seven days to God, Yahuwah, on the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein. Seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire unto Yahuwah, our God. On the eighth day shall be a holy convocation unto you. And you shall offer an offering made of fire unto our Father, Yahuwah. It is a solemn assembly. And ye shall do no servile work, therefore. So here we can see that God is telling Moses, the people of Israel, once again, hey, throughout the year, you know, I know you've got all your things going on and you, you know, you have to contend to your lives and work and stuff like that. But throughout the year, I'm giving you seven holidays to honor, seven holidays to acknowledge me. And on this one, he's telling them on the seventh um on the seventh month, the 15th day, you're supposed to have this holiday. The, the holiday, the feast of, say it, the feast of, so we can memorize it. Sukkot, right? Sukkot, okay. Now, I don't know if anyone's thinking it's like the seventh month, where would they put that as? So that put us in July. So are we going to about to celebrate Sukkot, right? July is the seventh month of the year? No. Okay, so <laughs> it is, but we don't celebrate Sukkot. There, and I've talked about it before. The calendar that they follow is the moon calendar. So remember, Passover pretty much starts in like, um, it changes little by little, but it's usually around like, uh, kind of like where Resurrection Sunday is. It's kind of in that vicinity. And that's where the beginning of the year starts. So usually the, the Feast of Tabernacles and Sukkot is going to fall like the end of September and even like October. So when October rolls around, we can get ready to have a big old party, a feast, okay? What is Holy Convocation? Does anyone know what that means? Well, uh, convo Convocation in Hebrew is Mikra. Uh, so learn some Hebrew. Say Mikra. Mikra. That means Convocation, which is basically a public gathering, uh, reading, and a meeting. So basically what God's saying on the first day of Sukkot, He's saying, I want you to all get together get together let's have a meeting together and let us worship let us read scripture uh let us uh you know uh, have a good time and then the next couple of days they're still supposed to honor it it's not necessarily that you, you still can go to work they could still do things but it's basically he's saying the first day and the eighth day is going to be a, a, a holy convocation so they get together so it's on the 15th day of the seventh month on the hebrew calendar <clears throat> And it lasts for seven days, and there is the, and, and there is a set apart day because usually it's usually just one full seven week, like. But this time there's an eighth day, and I'm gonna, we're gonna get into that why that is so important, prophetic. Okay, so during this seven day period, all native Israelites are instructed to dwell in booths, or temporary dwellings. So, 
Dwell in booths. Okay, thank you. Um, so one of the big things about Sukkot, Sukkot actually means uh, like booths or tents. Or, uh, and basically when the people left uh, uh, the Mount Sinai, right? There is a wedding day, right? Boom, they got married. <laughs> and sometimes I think about it. When you, th- when you look at the story, right? Uh, God delivered the people out of Egypt. You know, they saw all these miracles and plagues and stuff like that, right? Just think about it. And then they literally walked through the Red Sea, you know, like like huge miracle. Then they got taken to Mount Sinai, and then Moses went up to get basically uh, getting the law, the Torah, uh, and, and pretty much making Israel a covenant with them, a marriage. And then right after that, Moses come down, and what are they doing? They're worshiping the golden calf. They're all over the place. It's like, dude, on their wedding day, basically, right? So that's pretty bad. Israel's done some pretty bad things, right? But, of course, they were spared. And then after that, after the wedding, they go out and then they, they go into the wilderness, right? And they, they, they're, they're dwelling for bo- in, in tents and temporary dwellings. They were basically kind of nomadic. And they did that for how long? For 40 years, right? And they go into the wilderness. Uh, you know, one of the things uh, when you start studying, um, I always thought that the, the, the Israelites were just like suffering, you know, when they were in the wilderness, you know, because it makes it sound like and they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. But then when you start looking and you start reading <clears throat> what they actually went through, it wasn't really that bad. In fact, I would trade to be in that position in a heartbeat because li- literally they were surrounded by the presence of God 24-7. There was a huge cloud of God's presence in the day, and there was a pillar of fire at night, the way they describe it in the Bible. Basically, the Spirit of God, His presence was covering them. Like, they were in it 24-7 for 40 years, and they were walking around. And not only that, not only that, the angels in heaven basically were up there making bread and tortillas and they were just throwing it down to them, right? You know, if think about it, right? The manna from heaven, they were literally getting this like amazing uh, like food that the angels would make or who knows. And and then they got, God was literally the rock they were getting water from. Uh, they were sent quail. They were sending all these uh, uh, food and stuff like that. And it even says that their sandals and their garments, they didn't, it didn't age at all. They didn't wear out. It's even, some scholars even believe that people really didn't even age. It was almost like they were in a pocket, like a, a force field, and they were just protected from all the elements and everything like that. Yet, even with all that, the, the uh, people of Israel, a lot of them were still murmuring and complaining and, 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 and things like that. And you, you'd be like, what? But... It's not a lot of difference of what we are today. See, today, we even have more. We are able to to get into the presence of God. All we have to do is start worshiping, asking for the Holy Spirit to come into our lives. We have access to the presence of God all the time, all the time. And yet, what do we do? We're always complaining. We're you know, I don't have this or I don't have that. You know, maybe, you know, on Sundays we come, thank you, Lord. Thank you. Uh, you're so good. And then right when we leave again, we're like, oh, man, you know, this and that. And so we don't want to be like the people of Israel, at least the ones that were uh, complaining and murmuring. So basically all of them, because I think it was only two of them that didn't didn't make that first generation. It was uh, jo- uh, Joshua and do you remember? Starts with a C. Caleb. Joshua and Caleb. Okay. All right, so let's let's keep going. Um, in, uh, so so Deuteronomy sixteen thirteen through fifteen, and uh, oh, awesome! So I can know where I'm at. All right, I still got two hours. And you're like what? <laughs> okay, um, Deuteronomy sixteen thirteen thirteen through fifteen, and uh, I don't know if you want to go to Deuteronomy uh, the sixteen thirteen through fifteen, but I'll go ahead and read it. And it says, you shall keep the feast of Sukkot, of tabernacles. So, and the reason I'm reading this is, is 
I like to always see that there's uh, two witnesses. God always says that there has to be two witnesses. This is a second part in Scripture where God is commanding the people of Israel, which we are Israel, right, to keep this holiday, this holy day. You shall keep the Feast of Sukkot, tabernacle, seven days after you have gathered in the threshing floor and, and your wine. And you shall rejoice in your feast, you and your son and your daughter and your manservant, like maybe employee, no one has manservants anymore, and your uh, maidservant and the Levite, the stranger and the fatherless and the widow that are within your gates. Seven days shall you keep a solemn feast unto Yahuwah in the place which Yahuwah shall choose because Yahuwah God, our Father, shall bless you in all your increase and in all the works of your hand. Therefore, you shall surely rejoice. Hallelujah. So basically, it is a time to rejoice. And it's a commandment given not just to you, but to the whole family, to everybody. And um, sometimes I, just to make note, I do refer to like Yahuwah as being God the Father, or Yeshua being Jesus. Uh, those are kind of how I understand his names in Hebrew. I don't know. I, I Sometimes I just like to use it. I feel like it's been a blessing to my life. So, But, you know, it doesn't make a difference. Jesus, Yeshua, God, Lord, or Yahuwah. But it's kind of neat when you can actually use his real name, right? Amen? Like, instead of me calling y'all just like you or something, I call you Melissa or Cindy or Eric or Sam. Okay. All right. First John 5, 2 through 3. We're going to go through some scripture and it says by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments for this is love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous so a lot of times and uh like I said we're we're gonna get just we're just getting through the introduction of the Feast of Sukkot because there's so much to cover in this one. But uh, I want you all to understand that it is, it is very important for us to show how we love the Lord. Like, and I, I've said this before, we come, we know how God loves us, right? I mean, just being alive, we know that that is the mercy and the grace of our Father, right? Uh, Let's not even under uh, the understatement of, of Jesus, Yeshua, came, died for us, suffered for us on the cross, paid for our sins. Why? Because he loves us. Even after continuously, continuously making mistakes and falling short and going into paganism and idolatry and things like that, God still takes us back. He still takes us back and he loves us. So sometimes I think, well, man, you know, when we as Christians, when we, we're kind of taught like, yes, God loves us. You know, his mercy is forever. His grace is wonderful. But how do we love God? What do we do? Well, you know, a lot of people, like if you were to, if I were to tell you, how do, we show, how do we show our Father that we love him? Just by saying, I love you? You know? Sure. I mean, that, that helps. But... There's many, uh, even if you think of just like couples or like boyfriend and girlfriend, it's very easy to say, I love you, and you don't really mean it, you know? No, it's by your actions, right? If you really love somebody, you, you uh, show it by your fruits, right? By your actions. So how do we show the Lord God that we also love him? How do we do that? You might say, well, praying. Yeah, praying is good. Uh, what else? You know, we're coming to church, we're assembling together, you know, okay, yes. Maybe uh, reading scripture, reading his word, definitely, definitely, that's, that's a good way. But, you know, I'm going to summarize it all with one thing. So you know for sure that you are loving your father, that you are loving Jesus. And that is what First John was talking about. Keep his commandments. For this is love of God, that we keep his commandments. And I'm going to tell you right now, it says, and his commandments are not grievous. That means they're not a burden. What is his commandments? That is where we get in trouble. 
that is where we fall short, especially Christianity. Because it's easy to say, oh, yeah, follow his commandments. What are his commandments? Uh, go to church? No, it's not his commandment. It's not in scripture. I mean, it's, it's like very vague. You know, what are his commandments? The only way that we are going to know what God is commanding us to do is to read scripture. And I'm telling you right now, the more that I study, even, for example, what we're reading right now in the Feast of Sukkot, God is telling the people of Israel to keep his holy days. Kind of sounds like a commandment to me, right? I don't know. Uh, or what do you think? I mean, he's telling the people to, uh, with the different feasts and different holidays, he's saying, I want you to do these things. It is a, a statue forever and ever. Do these things. Well, if he's telling us to do these things forever and ever, well, forever is forever, right? So I believe in my heart that a lot of times we as Christianity have fallen for the, like I said before, the man-made traditions, the, you know, holidays that we celebrate today that have nothing to do with scripture, you know, we'll go over that in a little bit and we've gone over that before. And instead, we are oblivious to what is actually in scripture. Now, why is that? Is it uh, a way of maybe Satan deceiving us? Like, you know, hey, you know, don't even open the back part of the Bible. Just read the, uh, the, the Gospels, you know. And in a way, we've been deceived. Because if you look at it, uh, sometimes I, when, I, when I read the Gospels and, and people are like, well, I just, you know, as long as you go through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and, you know, the letters of Paul and, and Revelation. But remember, where did they learn, where did they learn their, their stuff from? There was no New Testament yet. They were in the process of writing it, right? They learned everything, everything that Jesus taught them, everything that they learned and they read was from the Torah, was from the, the, uh, the Old Testament that we call today, right? The prophets and the Psalms and stuff like that. Yet today, we, don't, we kind of ignore a lot of that part or we kind of read it like as old history and it doesn't really concern us. No, I encourage you today that not just to look at the Old Testament as the Old Testament. I Sometimes I even feel like it shouldn't even be called Old Testament, New Testament. It's just the scripture, you know, the scriptures. Like, Just take that out and, and just one big book, right? Okay, so how do we show that we love our Father? By following His commandments. Say it again. How do we show the Lord that we love Him? By following His commandments. All right. Praise God. So, okay, so let's go back to Sukkot. For many, this is a time of ga uh, to gather in large groups and literally, basically, go camping. Now, I know that, uh, I know like a couple years ago, the, the youth, didn't they do like a camping trip or something like that? It's probably not the best. Uh, and obviously, uh, here in uh, this area, camping's probably not the best thing to do unless you want to like sweat and get eaten by mosquitoes and stuff. Even though this kind of a, uh, this holiday does take place kind of in October, but it's still kind of like mosquitoes and stuff like that. Anyways, uh, so obviously in Israel, it's a little more drier climate, probably better. So they were able to like go out and make tents and stuff like that. And they were basically going camping for seven days. Um, so what do we do? How do we practice this commandment or this law or this feast? Uh, I, I've, I think... I think as long as we try the best that we can do in our heart, uh, I've seen many uh, things, uh, many people, uh, they'll even just put tents in their backyard or, or even in their living room. I know that'd be awesome for our kids because they like building like these forts. forts. They'll like put chairs and stuff and they'll put blankets. Anyways, so something like that. Basically, the point is, the whole point is to, to make a dwelling, to get together and with the family, read scripture, and spend a little bit of time with your heavenly Father. Amen. Can we do that? Can we? You think we? You think it's possible? Like when the, when the time comes, and this year even, I don't know exactly yet. I I need to calculate when that's going to happen. But uh, I think it would be good for us, kind of like how we're practicing Shavuot and Passover and first fruits and lemon bread. I think it's very good for us to start practicing and rehearsing these things. Uh, these holy days as God commanded. Amen. 
Okay, so um, let's see. Uh, will we be ready? Now, one of the things I wanted to point out that I kind of didn't say. Now, in Shavuot, we know that this is the wedding anniversary that we celebrated, right? Does everyone remember that? Some of you that weren't here, maybe, probably don't totally understand, but basically, Shavuot was, uh, which is the day of Pentecost, Mount Sinai, was our wedding day. So today, when we celebrate the day, it's basically celebrating our wedding anniversary, right? The Feast of Sukkot is basically the wedding feast. So, I... I have a little bit of time. We're probably going to finish on this note. But this, if, if you leave today, I want you to leave with this. And we'll continue the rest. But there's still so much information. Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, is the wedding feast. What do you mean the wedding feast? Okay, so everyone knows when you go, you get married, right? How many have gotten married here? <laughs> All right. Most, mostly everyone younger. But eventually, you've seen enough movies, you know. You go... You get married, you know, do you take this person? I do, I do. You may now kiss the bride. Dun, 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 dun. You walk out and you're married, right? Then after that, what happens? You go to the venue, right? You have the celebration, the party. Now I know today that when you think of that, like because of modern times, you're like, oh, now it's the stressful part, right? They're spending money in the venue and having to feed all these people that I didn't even invite and stuff like that. No, no, no. But, uh, but actually, in these days, in the old days, this was like the best time of all, right? Because people would get married and they were like, woohoo, no work, and we're going to party for seven days. That was the tradition. After they got married, they would have this festival for seven days. They would, they would celebrate. So Sukkot is the celebration of us getting married with Jesus, with Yeshua. And for seven days, we get to have this wedding feast, right? Now, I'm going to tell you that everything that is in Scripture, and it's crazy, but everything that has been spoken by the prophets and, and the law and the apostles, all boils down, all rolls to this, to this holiday, to this feast. And you're like, what do you mean? Like, basically, the whole uh, point of life, if you want to say, is pointing to the Feast of Sukkot. And you're like, what do you mean? This is the reward. If you can make it to the heavenly feast, the Feast of Sukkot, that means that's the reward. You made it, right? You were in your glorious body. Think of it like this. You know, God's second coming, right? He comes. He takes the church. He takes his believers. He takes his followers. And then after that, what happens? He reigns for a thousand years, his millennial kingdom. That is the wedding feast. The wedding feast is the millennial kingdom. If you make it to the millennial kingdom, you have the reward. That is what we need to strive for. That means that if you can make it to the wedding feast, there is no more sorrow. There is no more pain. There is no more death. You have conquered all those things. You have run the race. You have gotten to the finish line. You have made it. You've entered into the wedding, uh, into the wedding feast, and the angels are going to welcome you in. They say, "Hey, come on in, bride!" And here is the groom, the King of Kings, and that is what we need to push for. That is what we want to strive for. That is why it's so important that we learn about these things because they have important significance and relevance even today. So I tell you today. Like I said, I think I'm, I have like five more pages of notes and stuff like that in scripture. And we'll keep going over that because we'll get into the millennial kingdom, the feast, and what are the requirements of Sukkot and how maybe we can even uh, put that together even as a church today. But I encourage you. There he goes. Okay, there he goes. I encourage you today. Well, let, let's go ahead and stand. We'll go ahead and finish here. Um, I believe with all my heart that we as a church are at a point uh, where we are waking up each day learning more and more 
pushing away the deceptions and the traditions that have been passed down to us through our, you know, generations above us, you know, maybe had good intentions. I'm not saying they're all bad, but little by little have made it more of a doctrine. And we have been pushing away the things that God has really commanded. Even me, myself, if I were to ask y'all, you asked me a year ago, hey, do you practice the Feast of the Tabernacles from Sukkot? What is that? It's kind of sad that we as a Christianity don't even, even know that that even exists and it's a commandment. Yet we know about Christmas, we know about Easter, we know about Halloween, we know about Mother's Day and Father's Day and all these other things that have nothing to do with Scripture. I'm telling you right now, I believe that we, you guys, especially young generation, are growing up able to access the knowledge and wisdom that the Holy Spirit is trying to send to us to say, get ready so you can enter the wedding feast. So when that trumpet blows, we are ready to go in to the wedding feast. Hallelujah. Let us bow our heads. Dear Father, creator of all things, we worship you, we bless you, we honor you. We thank you so much, Father, for the time that you have given us to be able to assemble together and as brothers and sisters to be able to go over scripture that we may learn more and more about what you have set forth for us. We know that in this day, this time of deception, the time where the de devil is roaring like a lion trying to devour us, we know that we must stay steadfast. We must stick to your scripture and to your law, to your commandments, that we may do good because we know that you are the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody reaches the Father unless through you, Yeshua Jesus. We ask, Father, for, for our eyes to be open, for our ears to hear, that we may hear your scripture, that we may hear your commandments, that we may go by your law, that we may each day become better followers, better disciples. We love you so much. We glorify you, and we give you praise. And in Yeshua, in Jesus' holy name, we all say, amen.